I took this out of that and yet it's still alive. The machine lives. Hi guys and let me introduce you to my little MacBook Pro. It's a mid-2014 i7 16GB RAM with 512GB SSD and it's due for an upgrade. 512GB is certainly not enough for my editing so I've planned for a 2TB upgrade and it's by Intel. Whilst I was doing some research, of course through YouTube and the internet, about how to upgrade the SSD here, um, I was surprised to find that people only use OWC or Samsung. I have used the Intel 660p in PC builds and I find it to be very reliable. I was really hoping that this would work, so fingers crossed that I can actually pull it off. Well, certainly more than fingers crossed. Uh, the worst case scenario is I could give this to my son to put in his PC as a second place M.2. Before we do anything else though, it's really important that you back things up and I'm going to use the Apple native Time Machine backup. It works well and it's reliable, so why not? I would suggest doing this guys before you do anything because I feel that you might actually regret it if you don't do it. The time it takes for the Time Machine to do its actual backup will vary on the type of machine and the hardware you're recording the information to. Because of this factor, or certainly unknown factor, I would suggest putting the power cable in because you're making allowances for anything. You don't want the machine switching off in the middle of your precious backup. Another factor to consider is the amount of information you're backing up. So for example, I'm backing up 400 gigabytes of my 512 gigabyte SSD. This took nearly one hour to do a backup. In front of you, you will see my originally named backup time machine. That's the icon that suddenly appears when you attach your external SSD. There are several ways with which you can gain access to the Time Machine software in your Mac. So if you click on Launchpad and then go to System Preferences, you can click on that and then be faced with the options. Or indeed, if you've got it on the bars I've done here, you can click on System Preferences and access it that way. If you go and look in System Preferences, you'll then see in front of you an icon that says Time Machine. Thankfully, the software is very intuitive to use. When you click on it for the first time, you'll then be given some very brief basic on-screen instructions. Just select disk and in my case it's also registering what I've called it before. The name of your external SSD time machine backup will appear here. So click on that and then you move down to where it says use disk. All very simple so far guys. Whilst time machine is working you'll be giving an indicator such as this. This will give you information about how much data is left to go. Please don't worry if you can't see any information on the screen because if you followed the first steps I showed you, it's still working, I can assure you. It's just that sometimes in the past when I've done this, it doesn't always show up the same way as I'm doing it in front of you here. The other way of checking to make sure it's working is that you'll see that the data or flashing light on your SSD, your external SSD that is, is still working. And when it's finished, the light will probably go off or stay stationary. When the time machine backup is finished, this is what the screen looks like when it's finished what it needs to do. And it gives you all the relevant information that you need pertaining to you. Okay, so before we go any further, first thing we need to do is make the machine safe. So disconnect the power supply, and then we're gonna to go to our Apple menu, which you'll see up at the top of your screen. Click on that and go to shut down. Make sure you wait until the machine has finished switching down completely. All the lights are off, all the noises are off, and everything before you proceed any further. This is very important guys, it's all about keeping you safe. Okay, so now with everything switched off and everything closed down, we're gonna close up and go to the next bit. Okay, now to the physical stuff. We're gonna flip the machine over and prepare ourselves to remove the screws. You'll need to get the relevant size screwdriver for this. It's usually a P5. Um, some people have a Phillips 00 size. But a bit of advice here, when you're removing the screws, please remember to have a place to put the screws in the same shape that you took them away from the machine from. The reason for this is because all the screws are a slightly different size. It doesn't look like they are, but trust me, they really are a little bit different. You notice to the right hand side of the MacBook Pro, I've left myself a little bit of space so I can put the screws in the same order and the same sort of positioning from which I took them from. 
you might or might not have noticed that my hands are moving at super speed. This is not reality, of course, but I think it's quite nice to be able to see the whole process. Hence, I'm showing you the whole thing, including all my mistakes. Trust me when I say that it'll be wonderful putting these screws back in place when you know exactly where they go. No guesswork needed because it's all in front of you. Now to remove the back panel. It's best to use something that's plastic or best still, just use your fingernails if they're strong enough. And you just want to work your way around the edges. Start from the top like I'm doing here just to release it. It might just pop off easily though, this one did. But if it sort of tugs a little bit, just work your way gently around the edges until it just pops off. Take your time, don't rush, enjoy the process and go with its natural movement. Lift up the plate gently. And behold the magic of the insides. Lots of frightening looking electronics in here. Goodness me, there's a lot going on here in such a small place. I must say how remarkably clean it is inside. I thought there would be an animal living in there by now. Oh well, I'll roll with that. OK, so I've turned the machine over now, so it's a little bit easier for you to see how I'm working on it and also for me to see what I'm doing, more importantly. So the first thing is disconnect the battery. This is to ensure we don't get any accidental short circuits. This should just prise off nice and easily. You should not need to use excessive force whilst bending this up. It should just bend up quite easily. Just make sure that these metal contacts aren't connecting with the ones down below. Unless you buy Apple proprietary hardware such as the OWC SSDs, you will have to get an adapter. And I use the Syntec adapter. The link is in the description. This I found to be the most reliable, certainly from what I've read about on the internet. So when you purchase it, this is what I got. I got three assorted screwdrivers followed by obviously the Syntec adapter. These screwdrivers are actually magnetised, I later found out. It's actually quite handy. I'm really glad that the overall impression seems pretty good on first glance because I'm scared to death about ruining the life of my laptop, or indeed my life, if I break it, because my wife will surely kill me. With a smile, no doubt. The next stage is to use a Torx T5 screw. You remove the single screw that's holding the SSD in place taking care not to put any moisture or indeed any foreign object on top of the main board as this might cause you problems in the future. I'm removing the single restraining screw with the Torx T5 head that was supplied with the Syntec kit. After putting the screw in a safe place you just pinch the M.2 SSD either side taking care not to touch anything you shouldn't be, in other words anything that's not plastic. There's a slight little bit of resistance as you tug it out but it should come out relatively easy. Now on to get your SSD in hand and so we can clip it back in place. This is the one I picked. It's the Intel 660p series. It's been proven to be a very reliable performer in our gaming rig. I thought I'd share with you the unboxing process. Don't worry, it's not a long drawn out affair this, because this is exactly what you get. A little white booklet with warranty information and the actual M.2 itself. Quite a big non-event really, and this is two terabyte. And yet it should be awesome. Should be a fanfare and fireworks etc going off. Some level of excitement. Well let's add to the crescendo of this excitement shall we. Look at the top of these chip boards. And you'll notice, that's not a joke intended, and there's a slight difference in the shape. One's got a gap in the middle, the other one's got it on the right hand side. The Intel one is the NVMe, and the one on the left hand side is the adapter so we can fit into a Mac. It's important you make sure you get the right adapter to fit. Hence, I've put the link below in the description. Syntec have very kindly provided us with some screw lengths to actually go with this, so it should be able to fit almost anything. And now it's just the case of mating the two items together, making sure we don't force anything. Now the M.2, the Intel one, which is on the top here, must go in at a slight angle. It's about a 20 degree angle, I guess, or maybe 30 degree. You push it in to the end with a little bit of resistance. When you feel the resistance, just push it in a bit harder again, securing the end like I've just done here with my fingers, and it should just line up. You will certainly need to use a little bit more energy behind this as you push it together. Don't be scared of this, just keep it at the same sort of angles as I suggested and you will be absolutely fine. And now with the extra screws provided by Syntec, I've been able to establish which screw length is a little bit longer than the one we took out the MacBook Pro to begin with, because of course this next one needs to be a little bit longer to compensate for the thickness of the extra board. Just as before when we put the adapter with the Intel chip, we could have put this whole assembly together at the same sort of angle, and then push it together quite firmly into its little clamp place in the MacBook Pro. 
and if you notice the whole length is completely perfect with that Syntec adapter. I am by no means sponsored by Syntec. I know you probably think I am because I keep going on about it, but literally with a bit of research you too will find that it's the one to use as it's the most reliable unit. And here I am using the Syntec supplied screw to fit the SSD into place. Again, I would suggest don't rush this process, take your time and enjoy the moment because you don't wish to be making mistakes at this stage. You've gone this far, don't mess it up. In order for your lovely new SSD to be recognized, you need to be running High Sierra 10.13 or later. And remember on this occasion, guys, I'm using Big Sur. Last but not least, we're now going to secure the battery back into place. Just a nice gentle click and a push and just a bit of sprucing up or cleaning like I'm doing here. That's another video coming up though, guys, where I will be cleaning and stripping the fans. Okay, the next thing is to turn the laptop around and to replace the back panel. And on this occasion, I've decided not to put the screws in place yet because you can bet your bottom dollar that something will go wrong. You'll have to take it out and undo all those screws again. So I'm just gonna rest it in place to make sure it's safe before I turn it around the other way. This will give me some level of protection and indeed protect the components inside as I start to do the next part of this wonderful installation of Big Sur on my brand new SSD 2TB Intel 660p. Try saying that a few times where you've had something to drink, other than water that is. And now it's to the exciting bit of turning the machine on, see if it recognises it. Yet did I know at this stage I was doing this all wrong. You do switch it on however, hold down the command and the R button until you see something appear on the screen, like that for example. However, there was a key section I missed out on this and I didn't realize what I'd done until I had to go back over the steps over and over again. Not the hardware installation, but certainly how you get the system to work. The next thing you need to do is to type into the Google search engine bar, make Mac boot disk, and then click on the support center at Apple and follow the instructions online there. That is very important and that's what I should have done first after installing the hardware. Scroll down the page like I've done here, look at the operating system to make sure it matches with the one that you're using and it gives you perfect advice about what to do next. I wish to use Big Sur and that's the one they got at the top here and that's what I've got to copy and paste it says. Gosh this looks daunting to say the least. It's not, it's really not. Just follow the instructions, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it too. So please don't give up. The instructions then go on to tell you how to open a terminal, or sorry, no they don't, but open the terminal and how to copy and paste certain bits of information in the terminal lines. And then it talks and walks you through every step of the way. This is not that hard. Looks daunting, it's not. I will try and show you as best I can how I did it. The next step is to go and buy yourself a dongle. I'm choosing a SanDisk 32 gigabyte triple pack because it worked out really cheap to do so. As soon as the dongle arrives, stick it in the side of your MacBook and then name the drive. I called it boot disk. And now we're going to follow the on-screen instructions as laid down by Apple. So we're just going to copy and paste this line and put this into a thing called terminal. It's not massively clear how you get to terminal, so this is how you do it. Just double click on your hard drive. When it opens, click on the applications folder, not the library ones I'm circling here, it's the applications folder. Then double click on utilities and then you've got terminal. Open that and this is what you're faced with. Now where you've got the grey box here, this is where you right click to then paste that file you just copied earlier, followed by the name of your boot disk. Then all you do next is to type Y, then press enter and just leave the machine alone. Watch and learn as it does things. Well you're not really learning a lot, you're just looking at a lot of useless data to be honest with you. But it took about 15 minutes or so from the top of my head. Yours might take shorter time or it might take a longer time, who knows. Depends on your system and how it's all set up I guess. Everyone seems to be different. I know people suggest to go off and do something else when these sorts of things happen but I was riveted and excited all at the same time watching the screen and all it did at the end of this was to switch off. So I then switched the machine back on again, panicked to death thinking I'd done something wrong. I then pressed the power button once and held down the alt key and kept holding it until I could see something appear on the screen. This seemed to take forever. It didn't, because as you'll see, this is real time, it didn't take forever at all. When I did see something, I then released the Alt key. It then gave me the option to select network. This didn't allow me to do it, although I did try a few times here. 
I was getting a little bit panicky, thinking, gosh, what have I done wrong here? Have I really stuffed this up? Am I going to go back? No. All I did was just click the arrow above it, like I've just done there, and it went straight to the Apple sign. This was certainly a relief, as it looks quite familiar and friendly. And then it started to do this. A little information bar started to go out, or progress bar. And then it started progressing to this. Well, I had more options. Wow, something was actually happening. I certainly resisted the urge to click on anything else but Disk Utility, which is at the bottom here. And when you click on that, you're then faced with a Disk Utility program. This looks quite familiar. And look here, it actually recognizes my Intel drive. Can't believe it. This is actually working. Goodness me. Okay, so you select the drive that you want, and you make sure it's of the information you require, and you click Erase. This is weird, but this is how you format it and you name your drive. And this is what I named my drive. Make sure you leave the file format at APFS, as that seems to work for nearly everything or any scenario that I use on the Mac. You then select Erase and sit back and watch and let it go through its erasing process when in fact it's formatting it. After a few more seconds, the screen then changed to this. Two terabytes, wow, so that works so far, that's so far, so good, it's been recognized. I was getting cocky, so I thought, right, I'll use the backup time machine thing. It says it wasn't mounted. Oh gosh, so it didn't work after all. So all I did was to quit out the program. Thought, right, I have to go back to the drawing board again. And this is what I was faced with. Big Sur was being installed in the background at last. I had no idea. Right, I'll just go with this and I'll let it install because this is what I wanted it to do. Recognize the hard disk drive I put in there and then to install Big Sur on it and then to hopefully get my time machine working because it wasn't so far. Hopefully at some stage it might work. But anyway, I'll take you through the rest of this process and see what happens. These are all the screens I kept seeing and then it went to this. Black and into select your country or region. We're back into the Apple operating system at long last with the colors of Big Sur in the background. Possibly another hallelujah situation going on, I think. I then followed the ever familiar on-screen prompts until I came to the Migration Assistant. Now this is a good bit of news this, because this is bringing me ever so such closer to the time machine. And that's exactly what it did, because it came up with this on the screen. A time machine backup thing. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy about this. So I selected that and it gave me the option to um, restore from time machine or transfer information to this Mac from the time machine, which is exactly what I did. This actually worked, and it transferred all my files over the next two hours. Yes, two hours it took me, but there again, it was about 400 gigabytes of data I was transferring across, so it's quite significant. You might have less data, so it might take less time, but who knows? Everyone seems to be a little bit different. But I really am very grateful that you came along with me on this little journey in installing an Intel 660p M.2 drive 2 terabyte in this aging mid-2014 MacBook Pro. I am so happy, this all works absolutely perfectly and the machine works flawlessly. I performed a Blackmagic speed write test and these are the results you can see on the screen in front of you. When I performed this test before I did the installation, the write speed was around about 480, whereas the read speed was in fact a little bit higher at around about 670. However, what a big difference between the new drive and the old drive. This is certainly worth the upgrade guys, it can breathe new life into your machine. Well, did I enjoy doing this? Well, I kind of did and I kind of didn't. I kind of did because of the end result and I was excited. However, I was petrified about damaging my machine. It's worth the risk if you know what you're doing or you're willing to have a bit of common sense with this, guys. If you've got any element of doubt, give it to an expert. If not, have a go yourself. Just take care whilst doing it. See you soon. The machine is alive.